Who put out a man orbit of vision to the moon? Mobile off for you, please. 70 by Jules Verne. Seems very relevant in our busy city lives. How many amongst us have never seen the moon? At least through a telescope. How many of us are unfamiliar with the very interesting surface features of the moon that stare us in the face most of the time? And yet, here we are. 50 years since the very first landing of human footsteps on the moon through the Apollo 11 mission, an unparalleled achievement of space exploration. And in contemporary times, we as a country are also poised for the most technologically advanced and scientifically interesting studies of the moon, up close and personal. Chand ke paar. That is where India's Chandrayaan 1 and 2 orbital missions for the moon have been headed. With the Chandrayaan 2 mission also including a lander, Vikram, and a rover, Pragyan, for lunar studies in situ. Missions that demonstrate India's capabilities in terms of ventures to the moon and beyond, and more importantly, missions that are likely to fill in a lot of gaps in the understanding of our nearest celestial neighbor, the moon. After thousands of years of naked eye observations, 400 years of telescopic observations, a hundred odd years of astrophysical observations with spectroscopes, and a half century of spacecraft ventures towards a nearest celestial neighbor. What is it that we do know about this beautiful, changing beacon of the night? A beacon that beamed its benign presence for the inhabitants of the Earth from a time before any such inhabitants existed. The bright beacon of the night could sometimes be seen in broad daylight beautiful variations in the blues of the sky and the unique white of the gibbous moon. A routine occurrence perhaps, and yet something that would compel us to pause, observe, enjoy, and think. The sun might set, changing the brilliance of the blues into a host of shades of orange, yellow, and red. The muted white of the daytime moon becomes a brilliant gold in such dark skies, mesmerizing us into forgetting the presence of anything else in the sky. The millions of pinpoints of light that fill this inverted bowl above our heads are more prominent in the absence of the bright full moon. An apparent infinity of stars and some finite patterns they make in the sky. Perhaps we are already familiar with some of these. We are looking at winter skies here. This group of stars with its beautifully distinctive shape is the constellation of Orion. Our ancients imagined a hunter in this group of stars. These three stars in a close grouping and in an unusual straight line make up the belt of the hunter. Two stars here represent his shoulders and these two stars represent his legs. The hunter is closely followed by Canis Major, the great dog in the sky. Sirius, the brightest star in the sky, is the jewel around the neck of the dog. Procyon is in the constellation of Canis Minor, the little dog. Canis Major and Canis Minor are two constellations in the skies representing watchdogs in Greek mythology. 
These two twin stars are Castor and Pollux, part of the zodiacal constellation of Gemini or Mithun. This V-shaped group of stars close to this bright star Aldebaran or Rohini is the Hades cluster in the zodiacal constellation of Taurus or Frisha. This closely spaced intriguing Gucha of stars is the Pleiades cluster or the Kritika Nakshatra. Moving northwards, we see this W or M shaped group of stars forming the constellation of Cassiopeia or Sharmishtha. There are two triangles here, bisecting the wider of the two and extending the bisector in the sky brings us to the pole star, a very special star in the sky. As the night advances, all stars are seen to rise and set, while the pole star remains stationary in its location. The Dhruv or the Sthirtara. For thousands of years, the moon and its changing shape in the sky were closely observed with respect to the background stars. The 12 zodiacal constellations defined by all cultures, the 27 Indian Nakshatra, which served as landmarks to observe the changing positions of the moon in the sky, were all defined after many careful observations. The changing shape of the moon was found to be related to its position with respect to the sun. For instance, a thin crescent moon may be viewed in the western skies just after sunset. In the days following this, the moon appears further and further away from the setting sun and tends to become more and more gibbous until 14 days after the new moon, one sees a full moon placed 180 degrees away from the sun in the sky. The moon rises as the sun sets and sets as the sun rises the next morning. On the other hand, When the moon is Adha and it is Adhi Rat, the moon is just setting. It is a waxing half moon. In the days following Purnima, the moon rises later and later after sunset and is now waning gibbous until a thin crescent may be seen to rise just before sunrise in the morning. These phases of the moon repeat themselves again and again. Quite naturally, they form the basis of calendars and timekeeping in many civilizations. The Indian calendar, for instance, is lunisolar. It depends on the position of the sun as well as the moon against the background of the zodiacal constellations. On the day that it is Purnima, if the moon is near the star Magha in the constellation Leo, the month in which this full moon occurs is the Magha Mass. Two months later, the full moon is near the star Chitra over here in the Kanya Rashi. It is now the Chaitra Mass. Two months later, the full moon is near Jeshtha here in the visual scorpion of the sky or the Vrishthik Rashi. It is now the Jeshtha mass. This rhythm was seen to be followed year after year by the moon and ruled all our calendrical and cultural activities. The moon from its very brightness failed all the nearby stars in comparison. In the night sky, it would seem 
a monarch of all its surveys, with nothing else to compare with it in its vicinity. And yet, a bright star, seen in conjunction with the moon, would be a scene of such unforgettable beauty that it is no wonder that bright and not so bright stars, visible close to the moon, came into prominence as the 27 nakshatras in Indian astronomy. Sometimes the moon misbehaved. On a bright full moon night, a strange shadow seemed to move across the friendly orb of the moon, darkening it gradually until, lo, the moon had turned to black. A dull red glow on the entire face of the moon, instead of the familiar brightness of a full moon night. It was a matter of simple celestial shadows and geometry of orbits, with a solar eclipse happening only on some favorably positioned new moon days and the lunar eclipse happening on some full moon nights. These and many other naked eye observations of the moon continued for millennia and gave some preliminary inkling of the nature of this celestial object and its movements in the sky. The invention of the telescope brought in a whole new chapter into the story. In the year 1609, Galileo turned his telescope towards the moon and noted the presence of valleys, mountains, plains, and innumerable bowl-shaped depressions on its surface. Galileo's observations brought about a fundamental change, not just in the understanding of the moon, but a paradigm shift in people's understanding of Earth's status in the solar system. In the 400 years following these beginning telescopic observations, observers have been making themselves increasingly familiar with each and every land feature of the moon. The Malia, which were initially thought to have been oceans, but turned out to be flat plains formed by lava flows. The innumerable craters that have been formed over these billions of years, whenever meteoroid material was captured by moon's gravity. The mountain ranges, the rills, and finally, the very interesting rays emanating from many of the craters. Towards the end of the 19th century came revolutionary astrophysical observations of celestial objects. The observations of the spectrum of radiation coming from objects in the sky. What exactly is a spectrum? And why was this such a revolution? Spectroscopes measure the amount of radiation in different wavelengths or colors for optical radiation. Is the sun brighter in yellow light than in blue light? By how much? Is the moon brighter in yellow light than in blue light? Is this behavior of the moon the same as the sun? Or is there any difference in the spectrum of the moon from that of the sun? Answers to such questions allowed one to understand these bodies in a physical way that is not possible from simple imaging observations. Spectral studies are the most powerful of tools when it comes to estimating the types of materials and their abundance in distant inaccessible objects. 
Notice the relative abundance of aluminium or calcium on the moon. What elements are present in the atmosphere of Mars? All these and many more such questions can be answered through the power of spectroscopic studies. For instance, lunar eclipses showed different kinds of spectrum when viewed from different locations on the Earth. This then gave an indication that elements in the atmosphere of the Earth had a role to play in the reddish glow seen on the Moon during a lunar eclipse. By the 1940s, well before the space age, ground-based infrared studies of the Moon had revealed its surface to be a spread of fine dust. Measurements for the effective surface temperature of the Moon were being made using radio observations of the Moon, even as the world was just making the first few ventures into space. And then came a paradigm shift in the methods being adopted to study the Moon. Observe the Moon through multi-wavelength telescopes from the Earth, yes. But why not also go to the Moon and make some in-situ measurements? Why not bring a bit of the Moon back to Earth? Simple, isn't it? Not so simple, really. What makes space travel all the way to the moon such a challenging proposition? One needs to build a lightweight spacecraft that would be tough enough to withstand the extreme stresses related to the launch that would survive the transition from the warm and dense atmosphere of the Earth to the near vacuum freezing cold conditions of outer space. Survive many days of travel towards the moon through hostile interplanetary environment and finally be able to transfer to a stable orbit around the moon and transmit data back to the earth or perhaps be able to land safely on unknown terrain survive the landing and safely take off again to return back to Earth. Many of the beginning ventures in this direction failed. And then the moon missions started succeeding, one after the other, each transmitting back new information about the moon. Early in 1959, the Lunar One mission flew by the moon successfully and returned information about the absence of a magnetic field on the surface of the moon. Later, in the same year, the Lunar 2 was the first mission to impact on the moon, while Lunar 3 was the first mission to go around the moon and transmit the images of the far side of the moon. Subsequently, many of the range of missions obtained thousands of high-resolution optical images prior to impact in different regions of the moon. <coughs> With the Ranger 9 mission in 1965 came the first images from the moon broadcast on live television. Then, in November 1968, the Zond-6 mission succeeded in flying the first biological payload of turtles, wine flies, mealworms, plants, seeds, and some bacteria around the moon and back. December 1968 ushered in the launch of Apollo 8, a mission with three crew members who returned to Earth after 10 orbits around the moon. The first circumlunar mission with humans on board. A possible landing site was then identified. It was now time for the Apollo 11 mission that was to take three crew members. With two of them 
Neil Armstrong and Edwin Aldrin to take the lunar landing module and actually set foot on our nearest neighbor. The tension worldwide about the safety of the crew of this mission must have been tremendous. So much had been learned about the moon and yet there could be so many unknown or hostile environmental factors for humans actually walking on the moon. That transmission of Neil Armstrong's voice from the surface of the moon signaled the success of the mission. The crew conducted photographic and geologic studies, soil composition and seismic experiments and placed equipment for lunar laser ranging. The Eagle then took off safely from the lunar surface. The crew were rejoined with Larry Collins, who was the lone crew member in the orbiter, while the Eagle crew went to the moon and returned. Apollo 11 then successfully returned to Earth, achieving a milestone of lunar exploration that will never be forgotten. The Apollo 15, 16 and 17 missions used lunar rover vehicles to move on the lunar surface and obtain data from far and wide. The data obtained from these and other lunar missions was a treasure house of observations that scientists studied for decades. The Apollo missions had brought back about 380 kilograms in all of sample return material to be studied in Earth laboratories. A look at this image shows the various locations where many of the earlier moon missions had landed. The Apollo missions were discontinued in the 70s and the Earth seems to have left moon to itself for some decades. Not quite forgotten though. There were some crucial missions in later decades. The Clementine and the Lunar Prospector missions that left us with the intriguing but unconfirmed possibilities of the presence of water ice on the moon. What was the picture of the moon emerging from all these studies? And what were the unsolved problems about the moon at this stage? The studies indicated that the moon had a bulk composition, roughly similar to that of the outer mantle layers of the Earth. The moon rocks demonstrated that the material of the moon and the Earth is of the same age, about four and a half billion years old. The question of the utmost interest and importance is this. How was the moon formed? Did the earth itself split into two, throwing out the moon? Was the moon captured as an alien passing body? Did earth and moon form together? from primordial matter condensing into the solar system? Did a giant meteoroid hit the Earth, making it spit out some of its mantle material from which the moon was formed? What directions should future or present lunar space studies take to be able to answer these unresolved questions? The most important would be to obtain a complete geochemical mapping of moon material. This would quantitatively bring out the similarities and the differences of elemental distributions in the moon and on the earth. This would help resolve some of the questions about the origin of the moon. Such a geochemical mapping and many relevant spectral studies of the moon have been the primary objectives of the Chandrayaan missions. 
with its payloads for studying the moon from orbit through high resolution imaging through spectroscopy in optical infrared and x-ray wavelengths through radar studies and from its moon impact probe the chandrayaan 1 mission gave crucial inputs about the presence of water on the moon water present as hydroxyl ions or water bearing materials there are permanently dark cold trap zones in the lunar poles which could contain deposits of water ice brought in by meteoritic bombardment there could be water ice on the lunar poles but was it really there a surprise bonus from the chandrayaan 1 observations was a confirmed detection of water in these cold trap polar regions of the moon the confirmation came from the data of the american payload moon mineralogy mapper on chandrayaan 1 although unconfirmed glimpses of the same were also present in the data from the moon impact probe of chandrayaan 1 just before it impacted on the moon later observations from other contemporary missions gave crucial insights into the presence of water in various forms on the moon including water ice in subsurface regions an advanced version of the indigenous polar satellite launch vehicle was the chosen medium for placing the one ton class lunar craft into an elliptical transfer orbit for the chandrayaan 1 mission change to a lunar transfer trajectory and later lunar orbit insertion maneuvers changed the elliptical orbit of the craft to a hundred kilometer circular polar orbit around the moon the mission transmitted data to the ground control for nearly a year before falling silent due to technical glitches the powerful gslv mark 3 is the rocket for the launch of chandrayaan 2 to place it in a highly elliptical earth parking orbit a series of maneuvers raise it to a lunar transfer trajectory onward to its capture into a lunar orbit during the lunar transfer trajectory the orbiter and the lander vikram get separated and make their independent journey to a polar orbit around the moon vikram with the rover pragyan inside it scheduled to descend in a soft landing at a region near the lunar south pole the six-wheeled pragyan then rolls out of the lander and explores in detail a region within half a kilometer radius of the landing site the orbiter payloads survey the moon through high resolution three-dimensional imaging multi-wavelength spectroscopy and radar studies to obtain the required geochemical mapping and in particular map the presence of water ice in the polar regions the payloads on Vikram will make in situ measurements of lunar surface temperature profiles, plasma variations with varying solar conditions, and seismic measurements. Pragyan, on its merry way, is to conduct detailed spectroscopic studies of rocks and material near the landing site. The Chandrayaan 2, with its unique landing site on the lunar south pole, and the detailed topological and mineralogical studies will be a thrilling expansion of Indian footprint in space and a mission to contribute significantly towards our understanding of the origin and evolution of the moon. We look forward to the possibility that the wealth of data obtained by Chandrayaan missions will be made easily available to all interested students. Perhaps one of you enthusiastic youngsters will be in the team analyzing the results from all the payloads of these upcoming missions. Maybe you will be a part of the team working on the surface of the moon with radio or x-ray telescopes studying the universe from a region that is free of the atmosphere and disturbances of the earth.